It was an ordinary day in Rocky Mount, North Carolina, in early December 2006. But Julie Mae Bowling's co-workers couldn't shake a growing sense of dread. Julie, always punctual and reliable, hadn't shown up for work, and calls to her phone went unanswered. Concerned and uneasy, Linda Gardner, one of Julie's closest friends and colleagues, decided to check on her. As Linda arrived at Julie's house, an ominous feeling crept over her. The garage door was open and the Julie's car was still parked inside. Nervously, Linda entered the house, calling out Julie's name. The chilling sight that greeted her would be etched in her memory forever. Julie was lying on her back, lifeless, with multiple gunshot wounds. What could have led to such a brutal crime? Who would want Julie dead? On November 21, 1961, Harold and Dorothy Bowling welcomed Julie May into the world. Living in Rocky Mount, North Carolina in 2006, Julie, then 45 years old, was married to Mark Bowling, he was nine years younger than her. But Mark wasn't precisely the most loyal husband, and their relationship wasn't flawless either. He worked as a mortician and was the owner of Bowling's Funeral Home and Crematory, which had three locations. His current prosperity could be attributed to his parents, who back then were also morticians. Before he met Julie in the late 1990s, Mark had an affair with Rose Vincent, a 19-year-old cashier at a nearby grocery shop. They first met through her stepmother's funeral that was organized by him. Since Rose was practically raised by her stepmother for the most part, she felt great sorrow and turned to Mark for consolation. Mark was the first guy she had ever dated, she would later admit. They were together for almost five months before calling it quits after he got married to Julie. But somewhere between 2003 and 2004, the love story rekindled. By then they were meeting on a regular basis at his funeral houses. At that time, Rose was also married and even had three young kids. This time she had developed actual feelings for Mark and wished to become Mrs. Bowling. Not only that, but Mark was a fairly wealthy man having amassed substantial wealth from his funeral houses. For Rose, who was raised in poverty, this meant an entirely different lifestyle. In the end, it would turn out to be a recipe for disaster. In the early days of December, Mark went on a scuba diving trip to Florida, leaving Julie at home. Surprisingly, on December 8th, Julie did not show up for work, and neither would she pick up her phone. Linda Gardner, an acquaintance and fellow worker of her, was concerned because Julie had been confiding in her for the previous few weeks about her fear that Mark was going to take her life and that he would even get away with it by cremating her in the funeral house's oven. Another time, she confided in her that she worry he was having her followed. Linda's worst nightmare came true that day when she showed up at her residence. The garage door was open and Julie's car was still inside when she arrived. She went inside and was met with a cruel sight. Julie's body lying on her back, deceased from gunshot wound. She immediately dialed 911. Upon the arrival, the investigators determined that she had been shot four times. As they searched the house, they discovered a gun safe on top of which a large quantity of .3 two caliber Smith and Wesson bullets, was sitting. These were compared with the bullets that were used to take Julie's life, confirming they were the same. Nevertheless, they still had to locate the murder weapon. The next day, when the detectives brought Mark in for interrogation, they inquired as to whether he knew who might be the perpetrator. At that point, he opened up and admitted to cheating on his wife on several occasions as well as using escort services a few times. Then he mentioned Rose Vincent's name, the woman he had been seeing lately, to them. He stated that she had even started stalking him, saying she wished to wring Julie's neck and take a baseball bat to her. 
At first, when Rose was brought in for questioning, she denied any involvement in the crime. However, she soon changed her mind and started confessing everything after investigators misled her into believing they had evidence against her and that Mark had named her as the perpetrator. She admitted that she was the one who fired the gun, but she insisted that Mark was the one who planned the whole thing. She claimed that Mark had made her an offer of $50,000 to shoot his wife and had even threatened to take his own life if she refused. In addition, he gave her assurances that if she got rid of Julie, he would fulfill her every wish. While he was abroad in Florida, she claimed, he even sent her a map with detailed instructions on how to carry out the slaying. Additionally, investigators learned that the crime had been attempted three times prior to being successfully perpetrated on December 8, 2006. On the fateful day, she showed up during the early morning hours while it was still dark, as per her account. Mark had loosened the outside bulb's screws to prevent the light from turning on before he went on his trip. Once she got there, she texted Mark. As a response, Mark said, Let me call Julie and find out when she is leaving. Luckily, the answering machine picked up just before Julie and taped their call. He asked about when would she be leaving for work, to which she replied that she would be going at her usual time before providing him with the exact hour. He then inquired if she would be heading out through the garage, to which she answered, yes, of course. Lastly, he told her that he loved her and hung up. It's a rather weird conversation, and I'm sure Julie thought the same thing. Mark texted Rose back, informing her to get ready as Julie was about to leave through the garage. Julie unlocked the garage and turned the switch on the alarm, which is when Rose raced in. By the time Julie got to turn around, she had already been shot multiple times. Rose claimed that she fired the gun until its magazine was empty. After that, she drove to the cemetery where her stepmother was laid to rest and dumped the gun there. She gave them directions to the cemetery, which was on Old Carriage Road, close to the house, before the interrogation ended. As expected, they discovered a Depression-era .3, two-caliber, Harrington and Richardson revolver while combing through the cemetery. The whole diabolical plan, she claimed, began when she jokingly mentioned that she should knock off Julie. On the other hand, Mark used that as an opportunity to separate from his wife and started devising the plan. With everything at their disposal, the investigators took both of them into custody. Rose ultimately entered a guilty plea to charges of second-degree murder and first-degree murder conspiracy. She received a 28- to 34-year jail sentence. Moreover, she consented to testify against Mark. But six days into his October 2008 trial, he also made the decision to accept a plea bargain, admitting to second-degree slaying and conspiracy to commit slaying. As a result, he received a 19 years and 8 months jail sentence. He was expected to be released on August 31, 2022, however he didn't make it. On August 10, 2018, at the age of 47, he passed away from natural causes. Rose continues to serve her sentence at the North Carolina Correctional Institution for Women as of July 2024. Her projected release date is May 26, 2035, and due to her 13 infractions while incarcerated, including self-harm, property theft, assault, by throwing liquids, selling or misusing medication, and interfering with staff, it is unlikely that she will be released early for good behavior. In February 2009, Authorities responded to a complaint regarding a house in Ridgewood, Queens, New York. Neighbors heard the unmistakable sounds of a violent struggle coming from there, prompting a swift response from the NYPD. As officers stepped inside, they were greeted by a horrifying sight, a lifeless body, 
face down in a pool of blood. This was Rosario Prestigiacomo, a 64-year-old man, brutally attacked with a ferocity rarely seen. Sixteen stab wounds, countless blunt force injuries to the face, neck, body, and limbs. The walls of his home painted with blood. Who could commit such a savage act, and why? The attack was exceptionally violent, resulting in numerous puncture wounds in his lung, esophagus, chest, and lower abdomen. Early accounts emphasized the gravity of the crime. Blunt force injuries seemed to indicate that a large object, possibly a shovel, had been used. Blood samples were taken from the scene by crime scene investigators from the New York Police Department. They were then utilized by the city's medical examiner to produce DNA profiles. As a result, two profiles were established, one of the victims whilst another of an unidentified male. The second profile was added to databases, but it didn't match with any of the ones that were already there. The case went cold until March 2022. Numerous obstacles hampered the initial investigation into Prestigiacomo's slaying. Even after blood evidence was collected, providing with the victims as well as the unnamed male suspect's DNA profiles, searches of local, state, and federal DNA databases produced no results. Over a decade passed with no conclusive lead and thereby no resolution to the case. In an attempt to uncover more information about the second person, the District Attorney's Office, the New York City Police Department Cold Case Squad, Othram, Inc., a private laboratory that specializes in forensic-grade genome sequencing, and the U.S. Department of Homeland Security collaborated in March 2022. Forensic genetic genealogy employs genetic research and DNA analysis in order to identify DNA profiles. District Attorney said that Othram was able to employ cutting-edge DNA testing to establish a thorough genealogy profile from the blood found at the crime scene. In the meantime, the Forensic Investigations Division of the New York City Police Department assembled the victim's family tree using public documents and databases, hoping to identify potential suspects. Linda Doyle of the NYPD's Forensic Investigations Division and other forensic investigators used this information to create a family tree that suggested possible suspects or relatives. The investigation took a sharp turn when Anthony Scalizzi, the brother of Prestigia Como's ex-wife, became the main suspect as a result of this detailed analysis. That family tree led investigators to Prestigia Como's nephew, Anthony Scalisi. The 41-year-old Scalisi was a resident of Boynton Beach, Florida. In an effort to get a DNA sample, detectives from the Boynton Beach and New York City Police Departments conducted a survey of Scalisi in Florida. On February 17, 2024, about almost 15 years after his uncle's demise, Investigators were successful in recovering a discarded fork that had been used by Scalisi. The district attorney stated that once that fork underwent examination, its DNA profile provided a match with that of the unidentified DNA recovered from the crime site. Prestigia Como's fingernails were likewise found to contain matching DNA. The recovery of the discarded DNA culminated from meticulous surveillance by investigators from the Boynton Beach Police Department and the New York Police Department. This cooperative endeavor demonstrated the value of interjurisdictional cooperation in the resolution of cold cases. Anthony Scalisi was taken into custody by the United States Marshals, Boynton Beach Police Department, and the Regional Fugitive Task Force of the New York City Police Department on May 14th. On Wednesday, May 29th, he was extradited to New York City. David Cohen, Scalisi's attorney, stated that his client has entered a not guilty plea. For the time being, he is incarcerated at Rikers Island. His next court date is July 8th. If found guilty, Scalisi could spend anywhere from 25 years 
to a life term in prison. Authorities added that the motive behind is currently unknown. According to the district attorney's office, this is the first time a homicide suspect has been identified and apprehended using forensic genetic genealogy in New York City. District Attorney Melinda Katz stated in the news release, I formed a cold case unit to bring closure to grieving families and seek justice on behalf of victims. This case is an example of the perseverance and determination of the investigators on this and every cold case and highlights the successful partnership formed between my office and the New York City Police Department cold case squad. Defendants should not be able to evade justice no matter how much time has passed. This case's utilization of forensic genetic genealogy, which blends cutting-edge technology with conventional investigation methods, marks a notable achievement in forensic science. This methodology has established a standard for future investigations, while highlighting the significance of innovation in resolving cold cases and the potential of emerging technologies to completely revolutionize the field of crime solving. If you find this video compelling, show your support by giving it a thumbs up, subscribing to our channel, and ringing that notification bell. By doing so, you'll stay updated about the latest investigations and mysteries. Your support means the world to us as we continue to pursue the truth in the world of cold cases.